Amen. Father, we thank you for your presence and we ask for the anointing on the word and on the hearts so that the purpose for being here will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight, turn to Jeremiah again. We have chapter 12 to deal with. I trust you've read ahead, as always. Jeremiah chapter 12, I've entitled Speckled Birds, taken from verse 9, of course. Verse 9 of chapter 12, our message tonight is about speckled birds. He says, Mine heritage is unto me as a speckled bird. The birds round about are against her. Come ye, assemble all the beasts of the field, come and devour. So here's where we get our subject for tonight. Now the analogy of comparing Israel with a speckled bird, of course, is taken from nature, what actually happens in nature. The Hebrew, by the way, where we have translated here, speckled bird is literally a bird of varied colors. So if you think of a many-colored bird, translated speckled bird, I guess that's all right. We'll stay with that. But like a parakeet is of many colors. Now, if a bird like that escapes the cage and tries to fly away, I don't know if you're aware of it, but other birds will gather around that many-colored bird, attack it, and destroy it. That's the significance here of verse 9. God is warning sinful Israel, the time is at hand when her enemies round about will look upon her as a speckled bird, a bird of many colors, and destroy her. Now, on the basis of verse 9, I want to also draw an analogy. God has an analogy here. I want to draw one with respect to Christendom because we find that God still is concerned with speckled birds, still has to deal with speckled birds, religious birds, of course. So we want to look, first of all, at some of the speckled birds of institutional religion, since that's not the nest that God built. The speckled birds of institutional religion. Now, these speckled birds that we have reference to have over 250 different doctrinal colors somewhere between 250 and 300. Now, God is not the author of all that confusion, all that varied color. For God built one nest, the pattern of the church in the New Testament. It's plainly there for anyone who wants to see it. The pattern of the New Testament church is there. He built one nest, and he placed one kind of eggs in that nest, and they hatched out as one kind of bird, they were all singing one song, the same song. But then, like religious man always does, on the analogy of the poultry men who are always trying to come up with a new kind of breed, they're never satisfied with the kind of birds that God made when he made the turkeys and chickens and whatever, they're always crossbreeding, trying to produce a bigger and better bird to bring them more money. And so these are hybrid birds you see today, for the most part, you don't see original creation. And so religious men, just like poultry men, just seem that they cannot leave their hands off of God's bird that he created, or the original creation of God when he built the nest and put the birds in it. So man for centuries has been adding and subtracting, and what you've got today is a hybrid bird that's almost impossible to recognize. That is, as the Church of Jesus Christ. The barnyard today is in utter confusion with the birds. Instead of singing one song, they're singing, as I say, 250, 300 different tunes. Now, they're going to end up just like those in verse 9 here. He says, My inheritance, and if you can just put the church in there instead of Israel... My heritage is unto me as a speckled bird, and it's certainly that. A bird of many colors, many opinions and doctrines. He says the birds round about are going to be against her. And so come ye, assemble all the beasts of the field, come and devour. Chapter 12, verse 9. You can compare with that Hebrews chapter 12, where God says that he's getting ready to shake everything in heaven and earth, and that which he hasn't established is going to come falling down. Now, God is not the author of all of these different colors of opinion and practice and doctrine. 
I mean, to think so is about as ridiculous, I suppose, as a person can get. I told you of a man in a religious school where, well, where I used to be, who said to me that he believes God is the author of all of the denominations. So that means that God is the author of all this confusion in doctrine and practice and belief. Because there are no two, not even the Baptists. The Baptists are divided up into various kinds of Baptists, and so are the Methodists and the Presbyterians and the Lutherans. They can't even agree among themselves. And so until you go back to the New Testament pattern, then you're going to have confusion and disagreement and birds of various colors. Now, God is not the author of that. It's the result of two things. All of this confusion, all of these differing colors of opinion, it's a result of two things. First of all, man's incurable belief, and it's incurable, that he can improve on God's work. That's what they've been doing for 2,000 years. We call them denominations and so on. But man has this incurable belief he can improve on God's work. And so what we've ended up with are a lot of speckled birds, undernourished and weak, being fed on a diet of man's bread instead of the living bread, the manna that comes from heaven. Man has produced a spiritual monstrosity, distorted in development, All white meat with very little muscle. You know, the poultrymen are always striving to produce birds, chickens, and turkeys with these great, big, huge breasts, all white meat. That way they can make turkey rolls and that sort of thing. They get more money out of them, but they end up with birds with weak wings and legs. And so, first of all, I said, God is not the author of all this confusion, this varied colored bird that we see today called denominationalism. It's a result of man's incurable belief that he can improve on God's work. Secondly, another reason for that, it comes from roosting too long in the wrong nests. All of this confusion, this varied colored bird that we see, is a result of roosting too long in the wrong nest. And of course, obviously, denominational nests, religious and seminary nests, these are the nests of much opinion of man and very little, generally, of Clearly what the Bible teaches. Just take the whole charismatic scope of truth. That isn't taught in any seminary or religious school. In fact, it's opposed and alleged proof texts are sought to try to prove that divine healing or speaking in tongues, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and all the charismatic truth is not for today. And so these religious birds lay eggs which hatch out a nest full of speckled birds. And then each generation keeps adding to that variety And you end up with just a mess, off-colored confusion, is what we have today. Because each generation will add his opinion, his doctrine, his program, and you end up with a lot of speckled birds singing different tunes. Now, the fundamentalists and the evangelicals, and they're supposed generally to be the same thing, the conservatives, the fundamentalists, evangelicals, Refuse to join in with the National Council, the World Council nest. They won't get in a nest with them because they say, well, there are too many speckled birds in there. And there's no basis, doctrinal basis, for being a part of the ecumenical movement. But at the same time, those same fundamentalists and evangelicals will criticize those like us who do not want to get in their speckled bird nest with the evangelicals and fundamentalists. For the same reason, because there's no doctrinal basis for their ecumenical movement. They have an ecumenical movement going, too, to where they all want all to get together and agree on scientific proofs of the Bible and so forth. But the point is, some of these speckled birds have been so long in the denominational nest that even when God baptizes them in the Spirit and gives them a new song to sing and a new tongue to sing it with, they've been so long in that nest They can't bring themselves to leave the old roost. They want to stay there with their mother, the denominational system. So most charismatics don't come out and begin to fly with the freedom God has given them so they can worship God in spirit and truth. They stay right in the same old nest with the speckled birds and they end up to where you can't tell them from the other speckled birds in the nest. God is trying, you see, to make eagles out of us. That's why he baptizes us in the spirit. But too many have the old chicken heart. So they just want to stay in the barnyard, the old institutional religious barnyard. So often they have a charismatic song on their lips, but they're a chicken at heart. 
leave my old denominational mother, her nest. What are you talking about? Well, you see, the reason some react that way is because they lack the eagle's heart, because an eagle desires to soar in the heavens with God. He doesn't want to be limited to perching on a fence down in the barnyard, blown about by every wind of doctrine with those speckled birds clucking along, telling them what to believe or not to believe. Well, another thing, we've looked at something of the nature of the speckled bird that God is speaking here. He's addressing himself to Israel, but as I say, it'll apply to us. Let's look at some marks of speckled birds. Then you'll find out if you're one, some marks of speckled birds. Because not a few, even a faith assembly, have found that when the tests of faith come, the spots start coming out on their feathers, and they discovered, they didn't think they were, but they discovered they were speckled birds, and so they left and went back to the speckled bird nest. Some marks of the speckled bird. Now, I'm going to be addressing myself primarily to the ministry, or to ministers, but the principles will apply to any church member. Now, let's look again at the Hebrew meaning of this word translated speckled bird. The full translation is this, a varied colored bird of prey. It's too bad that translators so often do not translate what's in the Greek or Hebrew, but a speckled bird is a varied colored bird of prey. You see, outwardly beautiful, outwardly diverse in its colors and attractive, like so much of denominationalism is, are some of these TV ministries and worldwide ministries that we hear about today. It's very attractive to most. Because of their speckled bird ministry, outwardly they appear attractive to a lot of people, let's say the gullible, but inwardly they are by nature, God says, a bird of prey. You know, like a hawk, for example. Jesus speaks of the same thing concerning, well, the church age in Matthew 7, how outwardly, he says, these birds of prey, they're dressed in lamb's clothing, but what does he say? They are inwardly ravening wolves. Outwardly dressed in sheep's clothing, inwardly ravening wolves. And, of course, the gullible as always, follow the outward sheep's clothing message in ministry. Verse 22 of Matthew 7, where he says, They will cry in that day, Lord, Lord, we did many mighty works in your name. We performed miracles. We cast out demons. We prophesied. And that's what people follow. The gullible follow that sheep's clothing ministry. But they ignore the test that he gives in verses 20 and 21, where he says, by their fruits you will know them. And in verse 21, he says, my sheep will do my will. Not everyone that calls me Lord or works miracles or can speak in tongues or prophesy or cast out demons will enter the kingdom of God. Remember, he didn't say they didn't do those things. He said they did. But he said they don't meet the test of The true lambs of God are the true birds. They're speckled birds. Now, speckled birds, he also shows us over in Matthew 23, have pretense ministries. Pretense ministries. Because outwardly they appear attractive, but inwardly they, for pretense, he says, make long prayers to devour your finances. And if there's one thing that characterizes most, not some or much, but most of the ministry today that you hear and see, is that for a pretense, that is to say, we have to support the orphans and the old folks' home, or we have to win souls over in Africa or whatever, and so they'll try to put a guilt trip on you some way or another to get your money. Now, I've given you time and again examples of stuff I get in the mail and people send me, how there are multitudes of money changer ministries out there that are always seeking your money. And some of them, a number of them, I could name five or six that probably drag in over 300 millions of dollars a year to support their religious empires, their hobby ministries. What they've established in their own name always, it's always John Doe Incorporated, you know. And so they're taking your money to support everything from hospitals to secular education institutions, which has nothing to do with the message of the gospel as set forth in the New Testament. 
But this is write a letter month. Every time you turn the radio on and hear a religious program, this is write a letter month. Send in your needs. What do you need? Healing or a better job or whatever? Send in your requests and we will pray over them and be sure and enclose your offering. And it's the ones that have the money in the envelopes that get the answers from those ministries. I don't know if you know it, but there are two baskets. One for the money and one for those that don't send money. So this is right a letter month. Another radio minister I've heard occasionally is defending Americanism. And we are to send in money to fight communism. Well, of course, we know communism is atheistic and all of that, but there are a lot of worse things in communism that you better be concerned about. With respect to it consuming your time or your efforts or your finances, but... If you send in a donation, you'll get some literature back like this. How to keep your house safe from burglars. We already know how to do that. Psalm 91. Our instructions on how to write your congressman so you can fight communism. And then here's another letter. I tell you, I get so much of this. But here's one that you won't want to neglect to consider seriously. I don't know if you can see all the way up here, but that's a little blue apron. And so a little apron is going to be your act of faith. Let's see, where's the letter that goes with that to see how much I'm supposed to send in to get blessed. Well, I'm obeying God and sending you this special anointed prayer apron. And when you, in faith, send it back with your money, of course, you're going to release a great surge of miracle power to be made whole. And he said, I'm going to take this apron and I'm going to put it on my body when I preach in this miracle service. And these go out by the hundreds of thousands. And he goes on to say, be sure and send in at least a $10 offering along with the apron. When you send it back, send in at least a $10 offering. And when I preach in the miracle service, you're going to get your healing or whatever it is you need. And I got to thinking, you know, they go out by the hundreds of thousands, and he's going to wear the ones that come back with the offerings on his body. I don't see how I'd be able to move, you know, (laughs) under all the burden of that cloth. Now, there's no way in the world, because he'll get, and they do, they get thousands and tens of thousands of responses. You couldn't wear 10,000 of those in a service, let alone 100,000, and they expect two or 300,000 responses. Oh, friends, these pretense ministries. And remember, we'll remind you again of the brother who died and God restored him. He said one of the things he told me in this end time, any ministry that God has raised up will not ask for your money. Well, praise God, we've been telling you that for years before he had his vision or whatever. But speckled bird ministries are pretense ministries. They will take a text out of the Bible like Elijah, who was fed by the woman, you know, with the cruise of oil and meal and so forth, they'll use a text out of the Bible as a pretext so they can launch out and begin to present their own speckled bird doctrines and their speckled bird ministries, their religious hobby ministries, really, to make a show in the flesh. I found that speckled bird ministries and medical doctors and weather forecasters are the only three professions in the world that people will send the money even though they're wrong most of the time. (laughs) Weather prophets, medical doctors, and speckled bird ministries are the only three professions I know of in the world that people will pay them even though they're wrong. Now you think about that for a moment. Christians can't seem to wait to cash their paychecks to send into something if they can bargain with God and get... God, in a bind some way, so that if they send $10 or $50, he'll have to do something for them. Well, it's not just the speckled bird leaders who are outwardly appearing as doves, but inwardly, he says, they are birds of prey. But it's also the people sitting in the pews, denominational church members, as well as some charismatics, not just denominational, but charismatics, who oppose the Holy Spirit who will try to talk you out of your faith, who will threaten you with court action or whatever if you don't run your child to the doctors every time they have a sniffle. Now these two, as far as I'm concerned, are birds of prey. 
They are ravening wolves whose purpose, and it can be your family and your so-called friends or whatever, their purpose is to destroy your faith, to destroy you spiritually by attacking your faith, your charismatic experience. And they're successful often enough that you need to be on guard against it, that some of them who have that outward dove concern for you or for your child that's sick, inwardly they are birds of prey. They're trying to destroy your faith. Well, that's one characteristic we see of speckled birds is that it is pretense or a ravening type person. Secondly, you'll find speckled birds will sing a speckled bird tune. Now, the various types of speckled birds, we could spend a long time tonight mentioning the JDS bird nest or the shepherd ship or the ecumenical movement or a thousand other kinds, but just a couple of examples of the various types of speckled birds we're talking about. They sing a speckled bird tune. Take the ecumenical birds. Now, their song is peace on earth, goodwill among the speckled birds. They have a song of peace designed to gather all of the speckled birds back into one nest. They say because the body of Christ is divided and that's a sin, they want to gather them all back and end the schism in the body of Christ. But the nest they want to gather them in is not the nest that Jesus Christ built, the pattern of the New Testament church. It's a national council or world council of churches nest where birds of various colors, doctrines, and opinions gather. And, of course, eventually it's going to be the Vatican nest because they're all headed back to Rome. Most of them came out of Rome, so they're headed back. Or it can be a diluted, charismatic bird's nest, the one that where we're taught the doctrine isn't important. If you love Jesus, you're my brother nest. Now, the ecumenical speckled birds, and they can be charismatic, liberal, or fundamental, the ecumenical speckled birds fool and woo the gullible with this little song. Come into the nest, speckled birds, and sing. Love, not doctrine, is the essential thing. Our critics call it religious humanism, but nothing else can heal the schism. And the chorus, unity, unity, is our quest. Come, speckled birds, back to the nest sung to the tune of God Bless America. (laughs) The only thing's important, you see. Love, not doctrine, is the essential thing. So come back under your mother's wing. Our shepherd ship birds, just to give some examples, for Jesus as your shepherd and for the blood of Jesus as your covering and protection, they offer themselves as visible substitutes. They will act as your covering. They will act as your counselor. They will act as your source of truth. And outwardly, they appear as concerned shepherds. They call themselves shepherds, but inwardly, they're ravening wolves to bring you into bondage. They come singing the shepherd's song, Psalm 23, but they will quickly tell you that you are deceived if you say that the Lord is my shepherd, That's a deception, they say, that God has set shepherds in the body of Christ and you are to say, my pastor is my shepherd, or whatever his function is. Well, this sounds good to babies and to charismatics who haven't done their homework, and some don't do their homework. It sounds like a soothing lullaby. Now I've got someone that I can go to and find out all the answers to my problems, domestic or spiritual, and everything in between. Sounds like a soothing lullaby, and it is. It lulls them into sleep, and they wake up too late if they're in the shepherd ship prison. Another characteristic of speckled birds, besides what we've given you, thirdly, is speckled birds have a chicken's heart. A bird of prey nature, but a chicken at heart. We see this in verses 1 to 5 of chapter 12. We'll be reading verses 1 to 4 in a moment. Let's just look at verse 5 at this point. Where Jeremiah has been wondering why judgment has not fallen on the sinful nation of Israel as he has prophesied. And so here's God's answer, verse 5. He didn't answer why judgment hasn't fallen. He said, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with the horses? 
And if in the land of peace, wherein thou trustest, they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of the Jordan? I think it's plain enough. God is not only, of course, speaking to Jeremiah, because Jeremiah, you know, was concerned about when is all of this going to happen, the judgment and the deliverances and so forth of the righteous. So God is saying to us, as well as Jeremiah, if you cannot endure comparatively small trials that you're going through now for your faith and your beliefs and your practice, then what are you going to do when the sun really gets hot? Oh, you haven't experienced anything yet. You see, many people often reveal an otherwise concealed speckled bird or chicken heart in time of trial or testing. That is, the trials bring out the true nature. That is to say, they're ego-minded many times, but chicken-hearted. Now, there are a lot of ego-minded people that over the period of years come to faith assembly. They say, this is the answer. This is the message. This is the word. This is what we want. The full gospel without compromise. Well, if you can say anything about the message of ministry here, it's certainly without compromise because we've been suffering persecution because we refuse to compromise. But they're ego-minded. That's why they come to faith assembly, but they prove sometimes to be chicken-hearted. Their chicken's heart is manifested when God begins to teach them the true nature of biblical faith in their experience. So as long as they hear it, oh, that's fine, that sounds good, amen, I like that. But when they began to experience some of these things, they had an eagle's desire to be here, but they revealed themselves to be chicken at heart. Now, anybody can talk faith, and we've had any number here who talk faith, some who gave the biggest confessions, some who, thus saith the Lord, yea, this and yea, that, eight, ten years are not here now. So anybody can talk faith. Anybody can listen to faith as we teach it. In fact, almost anybody can teach faith. But you see, that doesn't make you an eagle simply because you can listen to faith and teach faith. Some people who do not have an eagle's heart, just an eagle's desire, have come into faith assembly and strutted around just like an eagle and picked up some eagle's feathers here at faith assembly. But in time of testing, it was shown to be that they weren't true eagle's feathers. They were just some like, well, the Indian chief that he had stolen from the eagle. They didn't belong to the chief. They weren't growing out of his head. They weren't his. He wasn't an eagle. He puts them in his headdress to appear as an eagle. That's the point. He isn't wearing feathers just because that's a fancy headdress, but he wants to show you that he has the, or at least have you believe that he has the power and the overall um, missions of the eagle. I remember one time back in my childhood days, my father had someone working for him, an uneducated person, humble, and he just didn't have a lot of education and understanding, and he actually thought that the feathers in an Indian's head were his own, that they grew out of his head. And so he went to a county fair or something where he saw an Indian chief, and he said, you know, I got up close to him, and they weren't his feathers. They were just old turkey feathers he had stuck in his hair. They didn't belong to him at all. Now, you would wonder how a person could become an adult and not know any better, but (laughs) spiritually speaking, we can ask you, are your feathers that you're wearing tonight real? Are the eagle's feathers? Are, are the feathers of a speckled bird? And it'll be the trials that'll bring out the spots. Oh, time and again, people who confess that they had an eagle's heart prove that they were chickens at heart. It's not until you get into a real nest where you'll have a real test of your true nature. Many times it'll take that to bring out the fact that you're either an eagle or a speckled bird. Now, institutional Christianity, dear friends, knows nothing about these trials and tests that we have to go through where God is proving to us and to others whether or not we're eagles or speckled birds. For example, a radio preacher teaching on Philippians 1.29, which says, It is given unto you not only to believe on Jesus Christ, but also to suffer for his sake. Of course, there are many passages that teach that, like 2 Timothy 3.12, where we're told that if we live a godly life in Christ Jesus, we'll suffer persecution. Acts 14.22, we must by much tribulation enter the kingdom, and the institutional system knows nothing of tribulation. 
except maybe for the sins of the people sometimes, but no persecution for living the godly life or for truth's sake. It's just absolutely almost 100% foreign to them. So he quoted this, an institutional church preacher, it's given unto you not only to believe on Christ, but to suffer for him. And then he said, listen to this, for Paul who wrote this, this was a reality. And I thought, doesn't that speak of the contemporary institutional church today where nothing comparing to what Paul experienced would be in their experience? That they teach the Bible like Philippians 1.29 as history, not as something that they ever expect to experience in their own lives. I thought, too, you know, there's some Pauls, a few Pauls left to know the reality of Philippians 1.29. Paul is saying there, if it's been given to you to believe on Christ, it's been given to you to suffer for Christ. And they know nothing of suffering. If they suffer the slightest bit of slander or persecution, they think that they've missed God. They must have sinned some way, and they better get back in fellowship with God. They look at you like you've lost your mind if you teach that persecution is promised the Christian. If he will do what Jesus did, teach what Jesus did, he will be persecuted. That's clearly taught. John 15, it's clearly taught here in Philippians 1.29, taught in 2 Timothy 3.12 and Acts 14.22 that we gave you. It's clearly taught in 1 Peter chapter 4, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. And they think you're strange if you teach that as if, you know, it's something for a Christian to look forward to. Well, Jeremiah here, as I said, is concerned over why the wicked are still prospering and not cut off as he's been prophesying. Lo, these many years he's been prophesying what was going to happen, and it isn't happening. Verse 1, Righteous art thou, O Lord. When I plead with thee, let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they blessed that deal very treacherously? Thou hast planted them, yea, they have taken root, they grow, yea, they bring forth fruit. Thou art near in their mouth, but far from their reins are their heart. But thou, O Lord, knowest me, thou hast seen me, and tried mine heart toward thee. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter, and prepare them for the day of slaughter. How long shall the land mourn? And the herbs of every field wither for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. Their sins are so great it even affects the crops, in other words. The beasts are consumed and the birds because they said, God shall not see our last end. And that's when God replies to him, Jeremiah, if you have run with the footmen and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with the horses? You'd never keep up with the horses. And if in the land of peace wherein you trust, They have wearied thee, then how will you do when the Jordan is at flood stage? So God's reply is, cheer up, Jeremiah, things are going to get worse. Things are going to get worse before they're better. Then in verse 6, which we didn't read, he said, things are already worse than you imagine. For even your brethren and the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with thee. Yea, they have called a multitude after thee. Believe them not, though they speak these things dove words to you, those fair words unto you, they're still birds of prey at heart. Now that's his own family. That's his brethren there in his hometown. So he said, your own relatives, in verse 6, are deceiving you. They coo to your face, but he said, don't believe them because they're like speckled birds, birds of prey at heart. And so God is saying to us, there's a principle here that if some of you, and of course, Being human, it happens time and again. If some of you get to worrying or murmuring because the trials are so great and wondering when they're going to end, like Jeremiah, when is God going to vindicate this faith message or the message I've been preaching and prophesying, he says, then God may just supply you like he did Jeremiah with some information. And he might say to you, cheer up, things are going to get worse in your life and your family and your church before they get better. In fact, he may say, as he did here to Jeremiah, not only are things going to get worse before they get better, but they're already worse than you even know. He said, Jeremiah, I want to tell you something. Even your own family, 
behind your back are trying to destroy you, your brethren. That's verse 6. Now, instead of allowing yourself, therefore, to get discouraged and dragging your feet around and feeling sorry for yourself because of your trials or whatever, begin to thank God that things are not worse than they are. Begin to thank God that he's already shown you that many times things have to get worse before they can get better. God has a time when he deals with sin and sinners and your persecutors and slanderers. And sometimes in his mercy and grace, you can thank him for this too. Verse 6, things are worse than you know. And so he doesn't let you know, doesn't reveal those things to you, lest you would faint in heart and get discouraged. You know, people are always trying to call me or write me or tell me about somebody going to try to sue me because I teach faith or got a long distance call regarding my safety. It was an emergency call. Will you accept it? I said, no, I don't want to hear these things. How many times, friends, I'm going to wave my arm over the whole church. Must I tell you I am not concerned with the devil's work. I'm too busy with the Lord's work. I don't want to run to these fortune tellers. And that's what people in effect are doing when they want to read all about what the media said or listen to all of this negative. I don't want to hear about that. I don't want that in my mind. have to try to get rid of it. Because my deliverance is in Psalm 91, Hebrews 13. I may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and so I don't fear what man may try to do to me. Wouldn't that be something for me to teach you faith, that faith will protect and deliver you and then run and hide because I learned that somebody's out to try to get me or sue me or whatever? My friends, I don't want to hear it. I thank God He preserves me from that knowledge of what people are doing. That would consume all of my time. Well, what's going to happen? Or should I look out the door before I back my car out? Oh, my God has preserved me thus far. Man has no power over me or you at all except it's given from heaven. And that would be for God's purpose and glory. And so I'm not going to go around confessing that. I'm going to confess just what I said, that man has no power over me whatsoever. The fear of man brings a snare. Thank God He doesn't reveal to you how bad it is out there against faith assembly. Some of you wouldn't be here. Some of you wouldn't make it through. Some of you wouldn't overcome. And because He's hiding it from you, He's going to give you time to get faith in your heart. Learn what faith is so you can stand when everything is collapsing around you. You can stand. And if He showed some of you that now, you'd leave even while I'm telling you about it. Now, I know that. That's thus saith the Lord. Not all are in faith or in faith assembly. Ten years, eight years, twelve years, and they give it up and go criticize it. So why should you think you can stand when they didn't? Thank God it isn't any worse than it is. And so if you can't stand running with the footman, what are you going to do when the horses start coming at you and the chariots? And if you can't make it through because the sun's a little hot, the persecution's a little warm and getting warmer with your feet on dry land, what are you going to do in the flooding of the Jordan when it'll take faith to escape to walk on the water and they can't follow you? Because they don't have any faith. All they've got is their unbelief. Oh, friends, thank God, thank God, thank God He doesn't show you the end. That's why it's such a sin to go to fortune tellers. And these people who read that trash in the media and watch the trashy vision and listen to all that slander and lies, I've warned you before, you're preparing your heart in time of trial to fail. Because the devil will use that in the time of your big trial. And all that slander and lies you've heard, the devil will suggest, well, is he right? Is that church right? Should I trust God alone and not let medical science have a shot at my child or whatever? You'll fail. And it's just like, as I say, you're going to fortune tellers because you're reading all of that and that is planting what the future is going to hold for you out there 
if things get any worse, well, I don't know. Maybe I better go somewhere else. And all of those thoughts are in your subconscious. Thank God he doesn't show you that. And we're trying to get you to keep from reading that and dwelling on that in your mind. You're just going to be the weak link in the church and pull the rest down. So it's enough for me, and I trust for you, to know that Romans 8.28 is still in the Bible, for all things are working together for good to those of us who love the Lord and know we're the called ones according to His purpose. You see, if the lion's roar makes you afraid, what are you going to do when you have to face the lion himself? The old devil. And if you find that a trial of July's heat is getting you down, what are you going to do when God sends you out in the desert in the August heat? Which will be ten times worse. And if right now a threat of death or persecution or slander is causing you to be defeated, what are you going to do when you have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death itself? You won't make it. His rod and staff won't comfort you because you couldn't stand the test and the trial when he was trying to prepare you. God is preparing an army and those who are falling by the wayside, he's letting it happen because he knows if you can't stand the trials of the home front, you'd never be able to stand to war on the battlefront when the battles start. See, eagle's feathers on a chicken's body won't fool the devil at all. So you better begin to let the Word of God molt those feathers off of you, those chicken feathers, so you can grow some feathers without spot while there's yet time. Some true eagle's feathers. And you do that by getting out of the speckled bird's nest. You say, I've already done that. I became charismatic. I'm a part of faith assembly. That's right. You came out of the system, but did you bring your mind with you? All the trouble we've had. Our people didn't bring their mind out of the denominational system with them. We have to labor in the word and doctrine to try to get your mind over here to faith assembly too and cleansed and purified from all of that negativism and doubt and unbelief and man's doctrine. Let the word of God purify. So you need that diet of ego's food. God wants you to deliver you from that canary bird seed you'd been eating. He wants you to get off the fence with the rest of the speckled birds and began to learn to fly like an eagle and soar in the heavens. Some of us are soaring in the heavens. And I can't help how it sounds. We don't mean it to be self-righteous. But it sometimes comes as a shock to us to find people are still on the fence about this or that. Down there with the speckled birds. Asking questions. Wondering if this or that. And we've been soaring so long with that message of faith that it's impossible to doubt because faith comes by hearing the word of God and we wonder why people doubt and why when they have a trial they have to have counseling somebody to hold their hand they don't know how to cope now that's all right for baby little chicks but not even baby eagles put up with that if you ever have studied about eagles you'll find they're up there in the nest testing their wings just waiting for the day that mother will push them off of the edge, and they can fly on their own. Chickens can't fly, especially the ones they're making now. The religious chickens are making with all that white meat, but no muscle. <laughs> no muscle. Well, God's school is just like the secular school in one respect. You have to take the lower grades and the easier courses first. But do you notice when you pass one test, you go to the second grade and third, and the tests get harder and harder. And so it is in God's school. I don't know why people are surprised when that happens. But the principle is set forth here in verse 5. If you can't run with a footman, what will you do when you have to run with the horses? And if you can't stand it, the hot sun on dry land, what will you do when the Jordan overflows? So this is why some never prosper financially. They never get off of that fence. They never pass their little tests financially. And so they're bound to be walking around like a chicken on the ground, on the earth. And this is why some ministries remain at the same level. It's because you see the trials sometimes reveal that ministers have a chicken's heart 
speckled feathers. There's nothing like a trial, remember, to bring out the spots on your feathers. If they're there, they'll come out. The sun will bring them out. The trials, the hot sun will bring them out. Or you can apply that to marriage or business or whatever. Some never get beyond a certain level because they've not passed their tests. They've tried to skip a few grades and they've missed the lessons. They're not doing their homework. They hear the pastor say there are hundreds of tapes. You ought to be in the books and the literature and studying. But we've had people for years who've got my books on their shelf and I doubt if they could tell you the name of what they got on their shelf. I'm just saying, friends, that trials have a way of bringing out the spots on your feathers and a speckled bird cannot stand the test when they get too severe and they want to go back to the speckled bird's nest where they can drink speckled bird's milk and not have any more problems or trials. Well, take verse 5 home with you, friends, because that's the message of the hour. That's the message for tonight. If you can't stand a little bit of trial and persecution and whatever we're going through now because your family and friends and the media and the authorities think you've lost your mind to go to a church in a cornfield, if you can't stand that, you'll never make it. And it's best to find it out now. Are your spots coming out or do the trials reveal that you have an eagle's heart and eagle feathers? Father, may it be that The admonitions through your prophet Jeremiah will find place in the hearts of the people that hear. And yet we know from past experience that some who wear the eagle's feathers they picked up from the faith message are chickens at heart and not willing, not willing to endure the trials of preparation for the end time in which we live. We know this to be true, but our prayer is that in your mercy and grace you will bring a deep conviction and desire to be an eagle and no longer a chicken, no longer a speckled bird, a bird of prey, but one who is in tune with the higher powers of God and soars heavenward. Nothing can harm or touch or disturb but as the ego be above all of what's going on in this earth as far as concern about personal welfare, persecution or whatever. But to see beyond the horizon that there is an end out there where God will vindicate this word that we teach and some believe. May this be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.